and then tomorrow we will either take up amendments and do a final vote at 11 o'clock, because I just heard there's no session, um, or else right after session. So that's, that's the plan uh, for that one bill. Okay, uh, that being said, um, uh, let's go to 946. Ms. Foxworth? Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Oh, okay, great. Senate Bill 946, Historic St. Mary's City Fort to 400 Commission. This bill establishes the Historic St. Mary's Fort to 400 Commission to celebrate Maryland's 400th anniversary. The commission will be made up, the commission will be made up of several individuals um, on the commission, including the Senate President and the Speaker of the House. The bill states that the commission shall represent Maryland's diverse population, and the bill also establishes commission meeting times and schedules. The roles of the commission will be to coordinate commemorative activities to celebrate 400th anniversary um, of Maryland and to promote it nationally and internationally. Also, the uh, role of the committee is to ensure development of a model social studies curriculum on the founding of the state. The bill requires the chair to create advisory committees focused on programs, events, education, curriculum, sponsorship, et cetera. And finally, the bill requires the commission to submit a report by September 1st, 2022 on the plan of action for the 400th commemoration and another report that's due by November 1st, 2022 on an update on the plan of action. The legislation lasts for 14 years and will expire thereafter. Um, no opposition presented at the hearing and no amendments submitted. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this bill to lay the groundwork for the 400-year commission, St. Mary City, and the landing? Uh, seeing no discussion, would anybody like to be recorded in the negative on the favorable? Seeing none, 946 will pass unanimously to the floor. Sure. Anybody else want to be, uh, join Senator Simon Air as a co-sponsor? Carosa, Simon Air. Okay, done. Thank you. Okay, let's go back up to 548. Senate Bill 548, Public Schools, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Surveys, Revisions. This bill requires the Maryland State Department of Education to include all tiers and questions in the CDC um, Youth Risk Survey, oh, Risk Behavior Survey on Adverse Childhood Experiences, or ACEs, and Positive Childhood Experiences in the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Sur System Survey, renamed the Youth Risk Behavior Survey slash Youth Tobacco Survey under the bill to reflect current practice. This bill repeals the department's ability to omit up to one-third of survey questions if the department considers the content inappropriate. Within six months of receiving the CDC YRBS data on ACEs and positive childhood experiences, the Department of Health must publish a data summary and trends report with the state and the county level data. There is one amendment from the sponsor, Senator Augustine, that begins on page two of your voting packet. This requires the department, in coordination with the Department of Health, to establish procedures for the administration of the survey. It requires the department in coordination with the Department of Health to include at least five questions instead of all of the tiers and questions from the CDC Youth Risk Behavior Survey on, on the ACEs or those adverse childhood experiences or positive childhood experiences. It also requires the department in coordination with the Department of Health to require a local school system to utilize passive parental consent before administering a survey it strikes the provision requiring the Department of Health to publish certain data from the survey within six months of administration. It adds to an existing Department of Health biennial reporting requirement beginning in fiscal year 2024 to report the state and county level data summary and trends report on the data collected from the survey. And finally, it requires the Department of Health to report on or before May 31st, 2023, on that same data from the survey administration. 
Um, Ms. Gooden, maybe I'm missing this. I thought it was explained to me, and maybe it is in the amendments, that they can, the health department with the edu board, state board can remove up to a third of the questions to make space. So as it was explained to me, it explained to me that the objection in their testimony from the Department of Health and MSDE was that they needed to keep the survey to 99 questions, which allowed for administration during a single class period, and that any additional questions would cost additional money. So that, as the way the bill came in, they objected to parts of that. So as the amendments pair that back, so they they allow them again to, to retain the authority to, um, to omit questions. They don't require them to use all of the, the ACEs questions and the, or the positive behavioral. Um, they have to include at least five. And they don't require them to go over the 99 question limit, which would cost the Department of Health money. So those are the... So, where in the amendments does it sit? Where in the amendments... Where in the amendments does it say they can remove questions or up to a third of the questions to make space? So essentially what they did is they just struck that part out of the, the, the original bill struck it out and then they, they took the strikeout out. Oh, I see. <laughs> For lack of a better way Got of saying it. it. Got it. Okay. It should be, a, you yeah, should no, see it more I, clearly I in the now. reprint. I, yeah. I see it. Can I follow up on that? Sure. So, I guess you're looking at page six of the reprint, or on the bottom, page six. Okay. At the top of the page, that's where they may admit right. the questions. Mm -hmm. But how does that make space for the five? I mean, if, if they already got 99 questions now, are they going to have to take existing questions and take those out they're currently using? I don't know if the survey is the same every single year. I mean, like, for example, if it's a, if a clear set of questions and then they can, I think they can mix it up. So there's different questions in every administration. So I'm assume my assumption would be that if they want to get to 99, now they have to include at least five from this ACEs or this positive stuff, as well as the additional material. So any, maybe they go through the survey and they find that some of these questions they don't really need to ask anymore. So they will substitute these new questions for those old questions that might have been on the survey. Right. But, but they, apparently they've had that authority anyway. I mean, right, and this words, was taking that out, which is what the objection. So, so there are 99 questions that each year, every other year, they can remove some questions. So this just affirms they can remove questions to make space for these five. But what I thought I heard you say is they had 99 questions. Through the process, they eliminated some, and they got down to 99. Yeah. And this is mandating that they put five more in. But, but it... So you're, re, what, re, what I'm it, saying is they could take five more that they already currently have and take them out. Correct. And correct. do we... I mean, is that... But, but they can do that now anyway. So in other words... Right, they could go to 94. Right, they don't have to do 99, but the request is that ni out, over 99 questions, the Department of Health is on the hook for for the costs of, an, of adding those questions to the survey. So e each year, even before this legislation, they could remove or change a third of the questions. This, when the bill came in, it took that out. We're putting that authority back in, so they will basically have to remove five of the 99, whatever the Department of Health, the Department of uh, Education, figure are appropriate to, that are no longer useful. Okay, and then the last thing, you said something about permissive. Passive, meaning Passive. essentially you agree your child will take the survey if they're in school unless you opt out. Is that new language or is that existing? That's current law. It's current law. Okay, is there a motion on the oldest? Ms. Goodman, the last thing you just said was that the questions may be different for every administration. There is some benefit to continuity to see about sexual activity or drug use or smoking or something. Can you just clarify what your thoughts or expectations or how that might be affected by this bill? I think that's a, just 
that's beyond my scope. No, I, uh, <laughs> my understanding, because we've had this bill years ago, is most of the questions they want to have a baseline and continuity to see trend lines, and but sometimes some of the 99 questions aren't as relevant, so this allows them to remove some. So it's not you're not seeing every question changing each year. Um, most dealing with behaviors, which is the purpose for the bill, uh, they want to keep a trend line. Okay, is there a motion? Um, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any objection to the um, sponsor's amendment, which pulls it back from the original language? Any objection to that amendment? Okay, the amendment is adopted. The bill is amended is before us. Discussion. Seeing none, I'm sorry, Senator Carosa. So we spent that time about the amendments, and those amendments were addressing the 99 questions issue. Is that correct? So as the bill came in, it allowed it to go up to, I don't know, 116, and there was pushback saying, one, it took too long, more than one class period, and two, it, it drove up the cost. So I think the sponsor heard that and came up with these amendments to keep it within the parameters of what exists. Okay, so in Dr. Salmon's testimony, she talks about questions such as those regarding forced sexual encounters which constitute a crime create concern. The survey would yield data reflecting knowledge of a crime but not allow for the support needed to help the victim of that crime since all responses are anonymous. I will tell you, I did have follow-up with the Department of Education following with, I sent them Senator Augustine's amendments and they said they were fine with the bill as amended. I think, again, her concerns and concerns expressed in other parts of the testimony were that the ACEs questions, because the survey is anonymous, that they can't follow up if a child was re-traumatized by some of the ACEs questions that would have been asked. So now this is limited to five. So it's either five, including the adverse childhood experiences questions or the positive childhood experiences questions. So I think some of that concern has been mitigated with these amendments. I guess maybe it's been mitigated at the state level, but not at the local level. So I'll be voting no. It, that's fine, Senator, obviously. The, the, led, the, the survey is anonymous to find trend lines if a, if a problem is getting better or worse for a response by the health department or the schools. Um, people can always say you, you want to know if they're smoking, but we can't help that one child. Well, that's not the purpose of the legislation to help one child. We, we would love to, but then you can't have anonymity. So it's looking at trend lines to do systemic improvement. So I think, you know, um, the good, uh, um, Secretary of Education or Superintendent um, put up something that, you know, you're going to raise this issue, but we can't help it. We can't help it individually, but we can help it societally and systemically um, through our counties and our local school systems. Um, uh, further questions, further debate? Okay, uh, let's take, Bill, as amended, let's take a roll call. Uh, move to the floor as such. Let's go to uh, 637. Senate Bill 637, Community Development Administration Live Near Your School Program Establishment. So run through this again. This bill requires the Community Development Administration, which is housed within Department of Housing and Community Development, to administer a home buyer assistance program which is for the purpose of providing low interest loans for purchasing homes 
near the student or a recent graduate school. The bill authorizes higher education institutions to provide funds that match those offered within the program and to provide matching funds when private employers, local governments, and higher education institutions provide similar programs. The bill places directives on the use of the loans by requiring the Community Development Administration to allow the loans to be used for the purchase of the home and to require a home purchase through loan funds to be the home buyer's main residence. It also requires the administration to oversee the marketing plans for the establishment of this program. Secondly, the bill establishes uh, the Live Near Your School program, which requires the administration to administer projects that provide current students and recent graduates of higher education institutions with grants to buy homes within sustainable communities that are near the student or recent graduate's educational institution. Grants under the program will not require an individual to be of limited income, as is the case with a lot of um, DHCD grant and loan funding programs. There was an opposition at the hearing. There are three sets of amendments um, to address, two sponsor amendments, uh, and each should be listed separately within your voting packet. So the first sponsor amendment authorizes instead of requires administration to over, oversee the program. So it removes any sort of mandate on um, the administration. Another sponsor amendment alters the definition of current student and recent graduate under both of the programs. So current students now will include undergraduate, graduate, and professional degree seeking students. And under the amendment, recent graduates include those who have graduated from public institutions and earned at least 120 undergraduate credits or at least 30 graduate or professional credits. So the expanded definition of student and recent graduate applies under both programs. And finally, an additional amendment by Senator Penske places a three-year sunset on the provisions, establishing that the bill will expire in 2024. Okay, let's put something in front of us. Um, is there a motion? Okay. It's been moved. It's been seconded. Um, I spoke with a sponsor. You know, <clears throat> I raised some concerns whether this is going to work or not. I, I suggested a uh, sunset. In case it's not, we shouldn't keep it on the books. He was fine with that. So that's my amendment to put a three-year sunset. You know, we're talking people who are 18 to 27. Um, I didn't have that kind of money to put a down payment even on a, a small, modest house. Um, so, look, I hope it works, and I hope we get more people living near a Coppin or living near a Bowie State or whatever, uh, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Uh, so anyway, I would like to move the uh, sunset, which the uh, sponsor said that he's fine with, three years. At least by year two or three, we should be able to uh, get a sense whether it's working or not. Any objection? Okay, uh, let's take up his um, the 109, uh, which, which says utilize available funding sources. He said this money in, is it CDA? Um, who's, uh, this utilizes money from what fund, uh, Ms. Foxworth? Well, it, it utilizes the money of which fund? That, Can you that's, my, that? that's my question. So the money that is already allocated through Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay. That's what the amendment is allowing for. So. Okay money within the budget that's already allocated for DHCD. Okay. Uh, so his amendment on nine um, explicitly says utilizes available funding sources from those departments. Um, any objection to the amendment on nine? Okay. And the amendment on eight clarifies who is um, – who is considered uh, an undergraduate or um, in a graduate program. I think he adds a graduate program uh, as well, which wasn't in the original uh, bill. Any objections to that amendment? Seeing none, that's adopted. So we have the bill as amended with the three amendments. Um, discussion, Senator. I thought we had a discussion uh, last time about uh, the bill didn't specify a distance, a uh, geographic area. Has that been amended at all? So there hasn't been any amendments, but there has been um, 
additional clarity after speaking with um, some folks from DHCD. So within this program and similar to um, live near your work with established, in this bill, it has to be within a sustainable community. And um, DHCD has sustainable communities all throughout the state. So if there is a sustainable community that's within a college, a university, then that would be the scope. But there isn't a distance or a radius that is specifically outlined within the legislation, but there, um, the scope provisions have been addressed through that um, conversation with DHCD. Also, my understanding, Senator, according to the sponsor, and I could have heard this wrong, that the institution will decide that, and they also have to put up some of the money. So they're not going to say, y'all come, because they're on the hook for some. So that's my understanding. Okay. Uh, on the Senator Carroza. Thank you. It's, it's a follow-up along those same lines. I also spoke to the Senate sponsor because I was trying to understand the um, location issue as, where, as well as the sustainability, uh, sustainable community issue. So the example I was trying to use is I represent University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which um, the town of Princess Anne is right there. So I was trying to figure out, you know, if, um, number one, I, I guess I need to know the definition of a sustainable community because I'm not sure if they are or not, or not. But I was trying to take the fact that we were vague on the location of, um, you know, who, who could benefit, the area that can benefit from this program. So I, do we have a definition of a sustainable community and do we know, do we have a list of the locations? So again, trying to see if this really is applying you know, is it, you know, and, and, I, and I did also have that conversation, Mr. Chair, with the sponsor about it, it will be up to the um, university or college to negotiate some of those details. But I guess I was really trying to find out, is this primarily to, to benefit a, an urban area or, or does it give some flexibility to um, some of our other universities and colleges in other, in other geographic regions? So a couple of the considerations, Senator, that DHCD looks into when designating these places as sustainable communities, they have to be priority funding areas. Um, they have to be places where financial assistance is needed for nonprofits and businesses. There has to be some sort of um, economic development outlook or prospect, and there has to be a sort of transit development opportunity. So there isn't a set formula, but there are considerations that they look into. And I think those factors apply just as equally to urban areas as they would to rural areas. And I understand that it's, I guess, because you only have so much funding that it, it would tend to be very kind of um, limited in geographic area, like a university could decide we're going to do uh, these two blocks or I guess depending with the uh, the scope of the availability of funds, um, I guess you know, just trying to take this from more. I think we all like the concept with how this would actually work in practice. It's it's my understanding that CDA has money, and they have to match with a local public university who also wants to kick in money. Right. Uh, for low interest loans, and again, according to the sponsor, he said defining near would be done between the university and uh, CDA. Um, again, they have to be between 18 and 27, I guess, or a or a grad student uh, to get this. So, I'm not sure there's more definition okay. beyond that. Thank you. And again, if it doesn't work in three years, it goes away. Um, further discussion? Uh, would anybody like to be uh, voted in the negative? Seeing none, the bill passes and goes to the floor. Thank you, Ms. Foxworth. We have to cut you out because we have to bring in someone new. Um, I Bye-bye. Uh, uh, it has been asked that we hold uh, 889. 
Um, so that's a hold, and at 305 or 308, we're going to go back to Centerville 965, also known as HB 1372. And we're going to have Ms. Heiss um, walk us through or run us through the bill, the House amendments, and some proposed Senate amendments. Um, we will wait till tomorrow to vote on it. As I said, we will do it at 11 o'clock or soon thereafter. Um, Welcome, uh, Ms. Heiss. Uh, and again, we had one walkthrough of this, I don't know, a week or two ago. I lose track. Um, so Ms. Heiss is going to give the high points and I think also go through what the House change, uh, changes in their uh, third reader version are, or the they're on third reader in the House. Is that right? No. It's, it's passed? passed oh, it's passed. So... Uh, because we're under a little bit of a time constraint, we're going to be moved, working off the House bill and not move the Senate bill because we're getting close to the end of session and there is an uh, urgency to get this passed and up to the governor. With that, uh, Rachel, you're on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so little... Um, so just so you know, I can't see you guys so um don't i won't necessarily know who's speaking to me or anything because the the there's a lag um on online so just interrupt me if whenever you need to um so what you should have on your desk is uh, two maybe three documents the um house bill 1372 third reader document um, which is as passed by the House. There is also um, a summary of the amendments that were adopted by the Appropriations Committee, and there were no changes on the floor. And then there is a um, uh, something that uh, several legislators have asked me for, was a summary of all the provisions that are in um, House Bill 1372 um, compared to the original Kerwin bill from last year and then with the amendments from the house. Uh, so if it's okay with everyone, I will use the larger document um, to uh, 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 Rachel, house amendments. Uh, uh, hold one second. I yep. believe yesterday everyone was emailed the third reader version and also a summary of the house amendments. So you might want to check your email if you want to have that near you or in front of you. You also have in on your desk, uh, a comparison of changes from last year's bill and this year's bill. So there are the documents um, Ms. Heiss was talking about. Madam Vice Chairman. Thank you. Just to make sure we're all literally on the same page here, uh, it looks like in front of you is the House version. I have a Senate version in front of me that's annotated and looks like it has a bunch of amendments. Are these is what I'm looking at at 965 with amendments, the House third reader version. No. No. No, I think you were sent the House third reader version okay. with their amendments. Okay. You should use that, not the Senate version. Okay. Rachel sent it yesterday afternoon. Rachel sent it yesterday afternoon. Yep. Okay, so just if it says uh, SB, put that aside. We're looking at HB 1372. Okay. Rachel, you're on. Okay. So since everyone has this um, comparison document, I think I'll work from that because I think everyone has a hard copy of that on their desks. And so this is a, so in the first column is uh, the provision that was in 
the original Kerwin bill from last year. The middle is the bill is introduced and the House and the Senate bills were identical. And then the third column are the amendments that the House has added to the bill. And um, so anything that isn't on this chart is not being changed in um, the revisions bill. So current law under um, chapter 36, which is House Bill 1300 from last year, is not being changed in this bill. Um, and so it doesn't have every single provision from Kerwin in it. So the first amendment um, is on, it's number five, uh, row five of the table on page one. And this um, deals with the provision where the funds were added for um, educational technology in the original bill. And it requires the school boards to prioritize devices for um, students. Uh, uh, over the other things. Um, it's page six. Device. Page six of the reprint near the top. It's um, capitalized and underlined. Yes. So that's not, it's on page six. Yeah, I told. Of, I told um, them. the third reader. Yep. At the top there. Uh, Senator Hester. Till the end. I'm happy to. Yeah, let, let's do that. I'm always afraid this drags out longer. So let's let uh, Ms. Heiss keep going. But just mark it and then dog ear the top or make a mark. Keep going, Rachel. Okay, got it. Um, the next amendment uh, is on page um, seven of the bill and uh, seven and eight. And um, this has to do with the community eligibility provision program that some school districts participate in. And this just extends the whole term of in the funding formula for an additional year until fiscal 26. Um, and then there's a technical amendment on page nine dealing with concentration of poverty um, calculation, but it's just purely technical on page nine. Um, on that, page 10, That's line 15 to 18. Proceed. On page 10 is um, a substantive change in concentration of poverty. Um, and you can see in the middle of page 10, starting in line 13, uh, the, the amendment would fund all of the eligible schools at 100% of the per pupil grant beginning in fiscal 2030. Um, so it, the bill is introduced was accelerating the phase in for uh, the highest concentration of poverty schools. And as a result, it actually extended the time for when some schools would get to 100% of their funding. And so this amendment takes it back to, it keeps the acceleration, but then it makes sure that all schools get 100% starting in fiscal 2030. And then right below that is um, a new reporting requirement uh, that asked MSDE to report in November on um, the things listed here related to looking at um, neighborhood indicators of poverty and also incorporating Medicaid data into direct certification and the use of an alternative uh, form for free and reduced price meals. Let, um, let me just, I'm gonna interrupt for one second. Line 26 to 28 on 10 is a conversation that's been going on for a few years of not staying with free and reduced lunch. It might not be the most accurate or the efficient way to get that data. They're looking at other ways where there's a, a car, strong correlation um, to reduce the, the misses and the gaps using free and reduced lunch. So that's talk about developing the plan for alternatives. Okay, please proceed. Okay, um, the next amendment is on page 17. And this has to do with the AIB. Um, and what the House Amendment uh, does is it uh, adds a provision that says that the AIB has um, authority over all the matters with its journey and if there's a conflict between the AIB and one of the entities, um, the state agencies, 
uh, and the LEAs and others, then the AIB's decision or policy uh, controls. And there's also um, at the bottom of the page an amendment to require the comprehensive implementation plan to include intended outcomes of the blueprint. Um, and that needs a very minor technical amendment that we've already drafted. The next amendment is on page um, 20. And this uh, relates to the expert review teams. These are the um, these are the teams that are created under the blueprint within the State Department of Education, teams of experts in uh, including teachers and principals, highly um, qualified and effective teachers and principals who would go into the schools, um, both the, the, the best performing and the, the schools that are not performing as well and um, evaluate them and, and try to whole best practices uh, to share around the state and for those that are need some assistance to provide it to them. And so this amendment in the, the House uh, added that the expert review teams should go into schools that are continuing to have um, learning loss that's related to COVID-19. The next amendment is on, I think, page 26. At the top of the page. Um, and this, this provision is in the college and career readiness section of the law. And it um, clarifies that, um, that the blueprint and the college and career readiness standard are not intended to um, alter the need for high quality programs related to fine arts, civics, physical education, and other programs that are um, to provide a holistic education and have well-rounded uh, students. Uh, hold for a second, Rachel. Um, this amendment came about because a number of groups that are promoting PE and civics and fine arts uh, wanted to make sure that they got money, they got priority, they got um, their formulas included. So this was more general um, umbrella language to say that all of those programs are important and should continue, but without asking each one to say what they want because the line was out the door of, I don't want to call them special interest, but, but narrow interest of instructional concern. So that's why that's in. Please. The next um, amendments are uh, in the back of the bill in the uncodified sections. So um, starting on page 35, um, and this is on page 14 of the document that you have, number 81. Um, there are a couple of amendments here related to summer school um, programs that are required in 2021 and 2022. Um, it amends the section that uh, authorizes uh, the programs to offer incentive pay to teachers. It adds other school employees, and then it also um, makes that subject to collective bargaining if applicable. And then further down on the page, it um, requires the summer school programs to be funded with state and federal uh, funding that is being provided for COVID-19 relief at no additional cost um, to schools uh, for the programs. And above that, it already does not allow a fee to be charged. There are also the, amendments the, on the uh, next Rachel, page. hold one second. Um, yep. We heard from the superintendents that recruiting teachers for the summer is not going to be so easy. They're pretty exhausted and beat up after the past year. So the idea of some incentive higher pay for the summer is something they said they absolutely positively need. So that's why this is here along with that it should be collectively bargained what that is. The, the other comment that um, Ms. Heiss mentioned is LEAs are getting a fair amount of federal money. 
in the stimulus. And we think that, and it's directed towards uh, educational COVID recovery. So we would like that those dollars to be used first before we use state dollars. So, um, and then the uh, due dates of the reports. Um, we only have one more page, and then I'm going to come back to you, the questions. So, um, Senator Hester, Senator Carroza, I'll, we'll be back to you in about one minute. Can you clarify what's going on in this document? R repeat. I'm, I'm sorry, can you just clarify? Are we on number 81 in the, in the grid and page 35 in the House bill? It's, it's page eight, number 81 on page 14 of the separate document, and it's page 35 of the bill. Correct. Okay, uh, Rachel, the 82 and 83. So um, there are a couple more things in 81 on page 36 related to um, the pre and post assessment, and then there's also similar state and federal funding language for the tutoring program. And then Senator Pinsky mentioned the change in the due dates for the summer school reports. Um, there's also additional requirement on reporting for the tutoring program, disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender, disability status, EL, and um, socioeconomic status. Then um, the next item is page, uh, sorry, item 82 which is on page 15 of the document and on page 37 of the report of the bill um, adds reporting requirements for the funds that are being provided to address um, COVID-19 related trauma and behavioral health issues. Um, and also um, specifies that state and federal funds should be used that are uh, provided for um, COVID-19 relief should be used um, for those programs. And then over on to the next page is just the rest of that reporting requirement. The last amendment is um, a new section six of the bill, uh, which requires the Department of Legislative Services to conduct a study on the impact on um, local governments of implementing the blueprint um, and their capacity to to meet the funding local funding requirements, and that that covers all the amendments. Okay, I'm going to call on Senator Hester. She had a question early on, and then Senator Carroza, um, and I'm sure there'll be others. Let me just reiterate that a number of the amendments and the document itself is fairly strong on accountability. We want to know what tutoring programs are used because there are different models. Uh, they have to do pre and post tests and do a report so we know what works. Um, we want to know where there's a report on where the dollars are spent and how they're spent. So I think that runs throughout the original Bill 1372 as well as the House amendments, which some came about because of uh, common conversations. So with that, back to Senator Hester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Uh, Rachel, for your for your help, um, I have two questions. The first is on uh, change number five on page six that requires the local boards and schools to prioritize the purchase of digital devices. And um, you and I have talked about this a lot <laughs> over the interim, um, and advocated for increased funding for this. What was the thinking in the House about putting digital devices? Um, in front of technical support or broadband connectivity. I mean, it seems like you got to have all three. Um, so the discussion in the House was uh, that given the, uh, you know, that we're still relying on um, virtual education, the hybrid education, that in the in the in the immediate term that the priority should be on making sure that every everyone has a, a, a working device. Even if you don't have activity. Let, me, let me jump in for a, a second. Doesn't it also ensure that this backfills the money they spent on Chromebooks or not? On what? Sorry. Doesn't this language also put the money that the LEA spent this past year on Chromebooks, making sure every student has one, that they get, I hate to say repaid, but backfilled to help with those costs? It will. It, um, 
the, the funding is being provided actually starting in fiscal 25 uh, to recognize the fact that the count, the school systems do have federal funds available to them to cover the costs of purchasing. Uh, many of them have been purchasing and upgrading Chromebooks and other devices. Um, and so the, the state funding is going to come in essentially when the federal funds run out. Um, recognizing that this is a cost that we're going to have to continue to um, to cover. Your schools are going to continue to need digital devices in the future. So it won't backfill it, but it will come in and pick up the, the state share of the cost um, when the federal funding runs out. Uh, Hester, I didn't mean to cut you off. Do you was your question answered or I mean, I know there are going to be some more amendments and uh, which might address your issue or you might even have an amendment. Uh, yeah. But if you have more questions for Ms. Heiss. Now I, have, I, have, I, I mean, I think she answered my question. I'm not sure I agree with this, but I have to think about it. Um, my other question was about the requiring of any metrics to evaluate the effectiveness of the behavioral health investments that we're putting forward this year. Um, I just I know that there the CDC is you know has some suggestions for tracking you know, mental and behavioral health outcomes um, and I just wanted to, to see if what well, if there was any reporting in place you know during this first year before the mental health consortium kicks in to track you know how well we're doing on mental and behavioral health. Uh, so on page 37 and 38 of the bill the last two pages. Uh, the House added reporting requirements for the um, the use of the um, trauma and behavioral health funding in fiscal 22. There's uh, 25. There's 10 million in fiscal 21 and 15 million in fiscal 22 uh, in state funds to be used for this. And um, so you can see the reporting requirement there, and you know it it could be expanded. So, this, so so far, it's just it looks to me like it's covering the reporting of the the funds, but not necessarily any kind of disaggregated metrics that would allow us to judge how our children are actually doing. Yeah, I think that's fair. Okay, thank you very much. I think I, earlier I had Senator Carosa, and then I saw Senator Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my I have several questions. Three of the four questions are tied to impact at the local level, and the other one has to do with um, the um, summer school programs and the incentives for teacher pay. So starting with the local theme, I wanted to know the extent of the authority over the locals with the um, uh, AIB, the Accounting Oversight Board, um, with this, the, the extent of this authority over the locals. I don't think that's changed from the last year's bill. Uh, has it, um, Ms. Heiss? Um, so it's one of the, it's one the, the issue amendments. Is, um, this new language regarding if there's a if there's a conflict between a decision of the AIB and a decision of um, one of the uh, entities that it has oversight of, which includes school systems, um, that there would uh, that the AIB's decision or policy would would control. So it strengthens um, the role of the it strengthens the role of this. Um, Oversight State Board, correct? Yeah. So there is language in um, in House Bill thirteen hundred, Chapter thirty six, um, that has that says, um, and it, I can read it to you. It's it's on page eighty one of the the law. It says the board is not intended to usurp or abrogate the operational authority of uh, MSDE. The Higher Education Commission, the Governor Workforce Development Board, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, or the day-to-day -day decision making of county boards, local superintendents, higher education, um, with uh, or other stakeholders with a role to play in the implementation of the blueprint. Um, and it says the board may not usurp or abrogate the lawful collective bargaining process. 
And then it's after those provisions uh, that this language about um, clarifying uh, that if there's a conflict between any of those entities and the AIB, that the AIB is sort of the, the last word. I have a series of local questions, so that was the first one. So basically, right, it, Senator, before you move on, I, I just want to be clear. In 1300, what we passed last year said that there was a framework, and it was expected it's done with fidelity, but every local was to develop their own plan, and if the plan they submitted to the AIB didn't embrace the general framework, they could tell them to redo it, but that the AIB was not going to tell them how to run their school system. So th this just clarifies that. I think more than with a local board, it's with the state board. Some people said, well, you know, the state board has some authority. And a lot of people felt it was clear in last year's bill, but this is really to, like, underline the clarity, I, I think. So I, I don't think... Well, but that's gives, what the amendment does. It, I, gives, I, it gives the AIB this authority, which it didn't have, right? Yeah, I, I believe it did in last year's bill. I think this just clarifies it. Okay, that, that, I understand. Yeah. Then the next part of that in the same um, amendment, it says it clarifies the comprehensive implementation plan must include intended outcomes. How are, are these outcomes determined? Um, by the IAB, AIB, excuse me, um, by the AIB because they write the comprehensive implementation plan. Uh, but the commission, um, the AIB will also rely on the commission's work in the commission report. And there are a number of um, indicators and um, expected outcomes in the reports. Okay. On the uh, Sixth Amendment requiring the expert review teams, um, to go into the schools. Um, where, what's the makeup of these teams again, and what, what is that, I guess I'm trying, the practicality of these expert review teams going into local schools, how does that in, work in practicality? Right, so that is in um, section um, 5411 of the education article uh, in House Bill 1300, and it lays out um, the purpose of the programs, um, it says the department, which is MSDE, will select um, members of the review teams, who are, uh, um, including um, teachers, um, school leaders, and other individuals who have expertise directly relevant to the purposes um, and duties of the program, that they'll be thoroughly trained. Um, it lays out what they'll do during a school visit. Um, that they'll make recommendations to the school, um, that uh, it includes that they can perform, uh, look at um, behavioral health services as well as um, student performance. There's there are sort of pages and pages about the expert review teams in the law. Um, and after they visit a school, they, they will um, submit a report to MSDE they uh, share their recommendations with the school. Um, and then um, there's also language about um, sort of which schools they will make a priority to visit. Um, and I know, I know, I know. And, and so, and so, so these basically, we had the language, going back to the chair's point, the expert review teams were already in the law, but we're specifically saying we're tying their going into the persistent learning losses directly related to COVID-19. So that's the amendment that, and I'm, so I'm assuming in the prior language, there was language that, again, to make it a productive um, process when these expert review teams go in as far as working with the locals. So I just, again, especially that's even more important now during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Chair, I'm down to two questions. The last local one, um, Rachel, has to do with um, Amendment 12, uh, this DLS study, which is um, actually coming up here January 1st, uh, 2022. And I want to understand this, obviously, um, looks like it will be 
I'm, I'm trying to understand exactly what information will be provided here because this goes to the heart of what I think whether these locals can you know af you know afford Kerwin so I wanted to understand that and then just one after that just one last question on uh, school uh, summer school programs so um, this provision was added by the House um, exactly to, to take a sort of a factual analytical look at um, the capacity of counties to be able to meet the uh, local funding requirements um, under, under the blueprint uh, and to provide, you know, information and data uh, to, to then allow the legislature to start to think about what they might want to do, if anything. Okay. And my last question is, it's going to the, um, the requirement about the summer school programs and um, specifically saying local school systems shall use additional state and federal funds. Um, and then it goes into the collective bargaining and the incentive pay for teachers. And I wanted to know if that um, incentive pay for teachers is tied to in-person learning with the students. Um, it, the, the, the law does, or the bill, I should say, um, does not specifically talk about uh, in-person versus virtual for summer school. So what do we know what the intention would be? I would think that for summer school, the fact that they need the additional tutoring, that it would be in person, but I was trying to seek some clarity on it. Senator, if I could jump in, um, I think the intent was in person, and I think it is in person is the intent. Uh, obviously, if there's a spike and we see when kids go back in April, May, and June, um, I, I think it's going to depend on the success and the lack of uh, expansion of the COVID virus. Um, but I think all the superintendents, when we spoke with them, and at least I think the House and myself, the expectation is it is in person. We think, one, it's much more effective than one-dimensional. Um, but we can't, we can't put that in here because if kids go back in May or June, you know, half the schools have to close. You know, we, we, we just can't put that in uh, statute. Well, but you did put language in about, you know, that whole college and career readiness when those other groups wanted to make sure their funding was not affected. I just, you know, can there be, it wouldn't be mandated language, but can we note that um, the expectation would be, assuming no spike in COVID-19, that this would be in-person learning. So there's an understanding with the teachers with the, the, in, the increased pay is tied to in-person learning. Yeah, um, we'll be happy to take that amendment or discuss that amendment when we take up amendments. I think it's in the realm of conversation, so I think you should raise that. Okay, thank you. That, although we're probably not going to get to the our own amendments today. We'll, we'll see how the time goes, but we'll take it up tomorrow, if not today. Senator Washington. Um, thank you. Um, this is, I guess, sort of a follow-up uh, on uh, Senator Hester's, but it, um, Rachel, it has to do with this section of uh, 5212 and requiring local boards. It seems, I don't know if it's a, a, new, a numbering error or whatever, but it's, it talks about that there's targeting per, per pupil foundation amount includes costs associated with blueprint for Maryland's future. And number eight includes educational technology, including, including digital devices, broadband connectivity, and information. Um, and that's on page six. And then on, also on page six, the amendment seems to be C, which is the local boards of education. But I'm just, I don't know if I'm just missing a page or something, but it goes from A and then it jumps to six, seven, eight, and then it goes to C. I'm looking at the reprint. I'm sorry, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm not oh, following. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. All right. So just go to page five of the House bill, which is what's online, right? The reprinted House bill. Page five of House Bill 1372. Okay. Right. And then we go to page. So it starts a section where it talks about the per pupil foundation amount and the costs associated with it. 
in implementing the blueprint. And then it says six, maintenance and operations of schools, and seven, supplies and materials for teachers, and eight, educational technology, including digital devices, broadband. Can I, do you see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So one, what is one, two, three, four, and five? Is that just that's in the bill and it's not being changed? Is is that right? Correct. One? Okay. Great. Correct. Okay. All right. So there's a section. So we should think of this entire bill sort of as an amendment to the to the blueprint, right? Okay. So, yes. That's so what when it we're, is. Exactly. When we're reading when we're reading through it, we're going to mm-hmm. have to reference back to the main bill in order to get the full, con- to fully understand what these amendments are doing. Is that correct? Um, so, so uh, in, I, in other words, one through five is valuable to look at, although it's not in this right. amendment or yeah, this yeah. bill or amendment. Right. But it has specifically to do with the prior, because I was trying to understand the, the amendment about prioritizing. And the, the senator asked about digital devices being above broadband connectivity, but in this bill, number eight, in this, in this bill, 1372, number eight says educational technology, including digital devices, broadband connectivity, and information. So I guess I'm trying to understand what, what really does this amendment do? I understand your, I totally understand your question now. Okay. But, um, <laughs> C is only to prioritizing the use of funds within under number eight. It does not have to do with any of the other purposes of the funds. So C is only saying within number eight, there should be a prioritization of digital devices, which does not affect number seven or six or any other prioritization. Okay. All right, then. Um, and then the, the other had to do, uh, and thank you, Senator, for asking those questions um, about the AIB board. I was wondering, what is plenary, plen, plenary authority? P, so that's the clarifying that AIB has plenary authority over matters. What's an example of something where there would be a conflict? Um, I think Senator Pinsky mentioned that I think one of the concerns is uh, particularly with the State Board of Education and if they perhaps um, were adopting a policy uh, that was essentially counter to the uh, the blueprint right. implementation right. Um, that there would not be a clear statement uh, in in the law that whether the AIB would have the authority to uh, intervene and. I would agree with Senator Pinsky. I think this is clarifying because I think if you yeah. read the law in its entirety, that it's it, which is what the AGs would normally do if they got this question, right. that there would be sort of the 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 full body of the law would suggest that the AIB uh, would would have control, but um, there was concern that it wasn't being explicitly stated. So that's yeah. what this does. And I, I guess I have a question about there's policy and then it's about sort of the fiscal adherence. Is there, is, is the AIE, and again, I guess, it, is this further clarifying, is that does the AIB have more of a, a fiscal, requires a fiscal adherence in terms of the plan and the budgeting, or, or is it also uh, policy decisions? jump in first, uh, Rachel, and then please fill in the gaps. I think it's both. I think it's broad policy, but not how you should teach math on Tuesday. That's still the local board, uh, or the state board and the local board. 
So they, they don't want to micromanage the schools or the day-to-day -day instruction, but the framework that goes with this of uh, tutoring K-3, to of uh, wraparound schools and community schools, mm -hmm. higher standards, CTE, that has to be, be implemented. I mean, that's the framework that AIB is, is responsible for, and some of the money is hooked to that. So in other words, they release the money if you're implementing the broad policy, but if you're getting stuff done and you're doing it right, they don't care about the details. Right. And, if, and if a school system wants particular support in teaching social studies in eighth grade, they're going to go to the State Department of Education if they want help. So, yeah. and, But because the State Board of Education and the State Department of Education wasn't very excited about this because there wasn't a lot of confidence in the State Department and the State Board, um, they weren't happily going along with it. And so I, you know, because they thought it was a critic in, in her criticism of their ability uh, to say no, to release money, to hold high standards, um, I think the House felt this language needed to be explicitly clear that when it came to implementing Kerwin, the broad policy and the money, AIB was in charge. Uh, thank uh, you. Rachel, is that pretty fair? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, and and it does answer because it talks about the ability to withhold funds. So at the end of the day, there's a a fiscal consequence for not. Right. And then just finally, I I I think that clarifying that the blueprint and the CCR standards are not intended to alter the need for a broad education. I do think it's important, and it's it is a policy decision, making sure that we're just we're not going to create these tracks in order to increase performance and start tracking so-called lower performing schools all of a sudden all become uh, you know um, low-tech uh, labor related jobs and then the more better performing job schools become the sort of the what always happens uh, the creme de la creme and get all the the best technology um, et cetera. so I think that that's both a, a policy um, important policy uh, amendment, and I think that that's a good one. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, further questions? Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a few things. Um, Rachel, going back to uh, summer school, if we could. Uh, so I, I think that health and not politics or this bill should dictate whether summer school should be virtual or in person. I hope it can be safely in person because I agree with the chairman that it is better. But um, one of the things that on page 34, 35, um, students that are um, especially affected, let me pull up the language real quickly, um, but it was uh, prioritizes enrollment for students with the greatest learning loss from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on education. How is that determined in that it's Joey and not Bobby or something? Uh, so that's the first question. I can pause in between each one if you like. Let's do that. Yeah. Well, that one, is, if you look at the next item down, they're not necessarily in, in the right order. Um, the, the idea, the intent is that there would be some type of an assessment of each student um, you know, before the end of the school year to identify and prioritize the students that have had the greatest learning loss. Okay, so that, that makes sense. Um, the question of meals, uh, if it's virtual, there are still hungry kids. I assume that farms and stuff is not necessarily indicative um, or, or goes into effect if it's still virtual learning or becomes virtual learning again? How does that work, please? So um, the federal government has extended the, um, the free summer food program, the summer feeding program, I think they call it. So just like last uh, summer when school systems were providing free meals to all students, any students, uh, it would be the same this summer. Okay. Um, they talk about students who can be paid. The incentive pay for teachers, incentive pay for students participating in the program who are employed or participating in career training through the partnership. Um, that language looks un unaffected here. Uh, there's no change because of COVID and no change from last year's bill. 
page 35, uh, lines 5 and 6. Ah, the, the training. Um, I, that's a good question. I mean, I, 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 I think that last summer there were some virtual um, career training that did happen in some of the school systems. So I would, I would think that it would still be possible, but um, through summer jobs programs um, online, but if you want to think I, I don't, about it, I don't or, know for sure. Yeah, if you want to look into it and just let us know. Yeah. Um, I just have two more questions. The page thirty-eight, uh, the maintenance of effort report. That seems awfully fast. Is that realistic? And will the jurisdictions be able to have the data in order to write such a report by January first? It is a very, uh, it is a, a short timeline. Um, we will, Department of Legislative Services will uh, do the best that we can with the time that we have to uh, produce a report. The, the helpful thing is the Department of Legislative Services is actually uh, collects all of the local government information in the state. We are kind of the, um, the holder of all that information. And so we do have a lot of data on local governments and local government finances that we can uh, utilize uh, to provide data and information and some analysis of the data. And that, that's, that's the intent, um, not, not to definitively say, yes, they can meet it or no, they can't, but to provide the information and the data to help move the discussion along and the analysis along. So I might suggest that that leaves a really quick turnaround for county budgets and school boards and all that to act, let alone the legislature to act. Um, but anyway, I'll leave that to you and the chairman maybe to think about. I just have one last item. On page 31, um, I think you all know that in my rockville Gaithersburg district, I have a lot of English language learners and we are among the two of the most diver top 10 most linguistically diverse uh, cities, mid-sized cities in the nation. Uh, so the work group um, on English language learners, um, I just want to give a heads up. Do you have any objection uh, to studying any disproportionate or increased impact of COVID on English language learners? Because I suspect that that would help guide our follow-up work and it doesn't seem like that language that group's mission has been amended through COVID. You're correct this is all, all we all the bill is doing is extending the um, due dates of yes. the, the work group's reports it did it, not it seems to make me the other changes. Yes if it's not uh, if the if committee colleagues agree I do think that it's likely that we would find that that community, that population would be disproportionately affected and therefore not only let's measure it, but then how do we address it moving forward? So those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rachel, I have two, two more quick questions. Um, we've discussed some the summer school on page 35 um, and discussed about like how it's, it's preferable to have as many kids back in school as possible. Can you also envision a situation where like 90% of the funding goes to those kids in school where there's, you know, significant learning loss, but that, you know, 10, 5 or 10% of those funds, you know, be allocated for online school so we can reach a, a greater number of kids over the summer? Is that a possibility? That's a policy question and, I, and I'm not sure that's an answer she's going to give, but you can offer that as an amendment. Um, but, it, but it doesn't have to be either or. I mean, the way this is written now, it does not say that it all has to be in school or it all has to be on, you know. No. I, I, okay. It's a policy. It's still a policy question, and, and I, hate to say, I, I hate to call Ms. Heiss a technocrat, but she's not here to give policy advice. Okay. Thank you. And then my, my final question is on... Um, 
the last page in this new section six that talks about DLS conducting a survey of the implementation. Uh, which, uh, what page, Senator? I'm sorry, page 38, section six, lines 14 through 22. And I'm curious because I had similar uh, language in one of my bills. Um, this requires that uh, DLS conduct a study of the impact on the county governments. I had wondered if there was any discussion in the House on um, a similar study just on the capacity of the State Department to, uh, to implement, you know, its duties underneath the blueprint uh, for Maryland's future. Are you talking about Section A? I'm talking about Section 6 on page right. 38. It, it, subsection A, B, and C kind of go together. Right, but uh, Section A, subsection A, is about maintenance of effort. That's why it's county governments. It's funding. So in, in my bill, in, in the bill that I had on MSDE capacity and accountability, it, in, it, it um, required the Department of Legislative Services to hire a consultant to look at the capacity of the State Department of Education to implement the, blue, the blueprint for Maryland's future. And I'm curious if when they were discussing this study, if they also discussed the study of this, the State Board of Education the State Department of Education as well? No, the House did not consider that. Okay, thank you. Seeing no lights on um, in 359, um, and, and uh, Senator, there is a capacity study in the President's bill. Yeah, it's my understanding that that language is still in the, in that bill that would require, um, I think, the AIB in consultation with DLS conduct a study um, of the capacity of the State Department of Education and um, the Higher Education Commission and other agencies to implement the blueprint. I'm sorry, Ms. White, which bill is that in? The Senate President's bill dealing with this, the, uh, the board. There was a, a, a subsection near the end that called for a capacity study of implementing the Kerwin. Okay, so I just need to clarify whether that's the, the capacity of the state board or the state department. department. It is the department. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. And I know two of our members have to get on the COVID work group. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, adjourn and... We will meet at 11 o'clock. I'm sorry. Do you have a light on? I'm sorry. No, uh, that's no problem. Uh, just so we will, after we take the senator's question, we will meet at 11 o'clock, bring amendments. I, look, I do know there are a number of already that have been circulated. Um, I don't know whether it's four or eight or whatever, and some have been proposed. I know I have one. Um, so please get them ready for tomorrow. We'll put the bill in front of us. We'll vote amendments up or down, and then we'll vote the bill as amended. And that's what we're going to do. And, um, and then we'll have, go on to our House hearings tomorrow. I think House hearings. Hopefully not too many Senate bills are left. But Okay, all House tomorrow. I mean, starting tomorrow, things should be a lot calmer. Um, Oh, okay. There are some set late. I assume they have numbers of 900 or 1,000. Um, so, yes, we will take up Senate bills, too. But uh, let's take uh, the Senator from Harford County. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm not really sure how to ask this. I'll, I'll throw this out here. Um, during the discussions in the House, uh, well, first let me tell you my main concern. I have a concern with, you know, failing, failing students are going to be shove, shoveled along even if they're not ready to go to that next grade. So I was just looking at the... the Senator, repeat that, please. I have a concern that, you know, with the learning loss, there are some, some students that are going to be kind of left behind and they're are going to uh, possibly shuffle along to the next grade when they really shouldn't be. So I was looking at the, uh, the transitional supplemental instruction, and it talks about the pre- and post-assessment. Uh, so at the post-assessment, if it shows that they're, they're way behind... What happens next? That, that's what I was trying to figure out. If, if they're not up to snuff, so to speak, and that's shown through that um, testing, what happens? That could be left up to each individual district. How will that work? Uh, 
I'll let Ms. Heiss answer, and then I'll try to give my two cents. <laughs> Well, um, I think the intent, the whole intent of the transitional supplemental instruction program is um, to continue providing the services until students are, um, you know, up to grade level and are, you know, the goal of that program is that students are reading at a proficient level uh, by grade three. Uh, and then also if, if they're having math challenges that they are proficient in math in grade three. So, if the students are still having um, learning loss and, and are not caught up, then they would continue to participate in the program. But but that's if they're below third grade or below. I, I, I'm going to read, read into the question yeah. that the special funding for the next 15 months is for fourth grade through 12th grade. And I think the senator is asking, let's say that seventh grader, even with a year of tutoring, is still significantly far behind what happens to he or she. Senator is out. Oh, You're perfect. You, know, I you ask it better than I did. <laughs> okay, I see. Um, well, the reason that the program was focused on the early grades was the intent that as the blueprint was being implemented and teachers were um, more, had more uh, capability to identify students that were struggling and uh, provide the, the supports and the additional um, learning that was needed that, that the classroom teachers would be able to do that um, over time. In other words, when Kerwin looked at the big picture over multiple years, they said we had to get everyone to reading level, grade level by third grade, and if it meant getting support in your grade, first grade and second grade, we're going to damn well get them at third grade, they're going to be at grade level. No one foresaw the pandemic. So this bill is a stopgap for, for summer school for 21 and 22 and tutoring the year during to the, do the best we can for the rest of the students to get them up to grade level. But you know, it's going to be up to the legislature if next year they want to spend even more money if they found more kids are behind grade level. You know, some people voted for the Kerwin bill and some voted against it and some didn't, um, and some, you know, didn't support the override of the veto. And that was to deal with kids K to three. Right. Well, this, this bill doesn't play out three years. It plays out like 15 months. Right. So just to piggyback on that. So was there any talk? One thing I haven't heard really anybody talk about is, you know, some students may have to re just repeat a grade if they're that far behind. Was there any discussion of that in the uh, on the House side? It seems like that's not talked about at all, like as even an option. But why, if if a, a child is shown to be so far behind that they that they're just not going to catch up, it seems to me like you want to, you know, having the conversation about they're just going to have to repeat the grade. Well, Senator, I, I'm going to jump in here. You know, I think that is up to the 24 superintendents. Um, and I think, as I've talked to the superintendents across the state, community college presidents, and even the four-year institutions, I think everyone quietly acknowledges this past year is going to have an asterisk next to it. You know, it's like a shortened baseball season, you know, where, or you, you break a home run record or something, playing extra games or whatever. And I'm not sure anybody, I have not heard an answer that I can share with you that because people aren't sure how to handle it. It's, when I talked to 24 superintendents, it wasn't like they're going to say, we're going to hold back 30% of our student population. They weren't ready to do that. Um, are there going to be a lot of kids who are not college and career ready? Absolutely. Um, but I, I don't think the House has taken that on. You know, we can take it on tomorrow, uh, and it's a, it's a big question. And I sure to hell do not have an answer for it. Um, but everyone in education, K to 22, are asking that very same question. Okay, thanks. Senator, and then the last question. Are we having a floor session tomorrow? Okay. No floor session tomorrow? It's my understanding there's no floor session tomorrow. Okay. So that was supposed to start at 11, right? right? So we will start at 11. Here. And if we finish at 12 or 1230. Here or, or virtual? 
we're going to be voting on Perfect. amendments in the bill, so that'll be in person. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think this was a good walkthrough. Thank you, Ms. Heist. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, committee, for your questions. Um, if you don't have a uh, COVID meeting or executive noms, you're free till seven. Others have other meetings. So uh, we're adjourned. Thank you all.